Chapter 1. June, 1885 Beckham, Massachusetts. Ellen Bronson washed the last dish straining her mind to come up with a way to get money to come up with more food. She and her younger sister, Melinda, were down to their last pot of beans. There was just enough cornmeal for one more pan of cornbread, and then they had nothing. When their father had died just two weeks before, they'd been convinced that they'd find where he'd hidden the money he'd saved, but the more they searched the more despondent they became. They'd finally come to the conclusion that there was no money to be found. They'd always lived a good life, albeit a simple one living on the outskirts of Beckham, Massachusetts on a small farm. The two sisters had continued to milk the cows that kept their dairy farm afloat, but the dairy told them they'd already paid their father in advance for the entire month. It was the 15th, and they had no money, and as far as Ellen could see, no way to get more. Melinda put away the bowl and put it in the cupboard. What are we going to do? Ellen shook her head despondently. I have no idea. Dad always kept up with the money. He never even discussed it with us, always just saying it wasn't something we should be worried about. The two sisters were both slim with dark hair. Ellen's hair was a medium brown, while Melinda's was so dark it was almost black. Ellen had gray eyes, exactly the color of a dark cloud just before a storm. Melinda's eyes were a brown that always seemed to be filled with laughter. The two sisters were only eleven months apart, with Ellen being the elder. Because they had lost their mother at a young age, they had grown closer than most sisters and tended to do most things together. Ellen was the natural leader between them, not only because she was slightly older, but because she actually enjoyed doing the work around the farm. Melinda would rather curl up with a good book than clean the house, but she always helped when asked. Together they'd worked to keep the farm going since their father had died. Just a couple more weeks and they would have some money again and be able to buy more food. They could make it. They just had to tighten their belts a bit. I know. But now I'm getting worried. Should we go see the man at the bank and see if he had some money there for us? Melinda asked. He always said the safest place to keep your money was in your own house. He didn't trust bankers. There's no way he'd have had a bank account and not told us about it. Melinda leaned against the cupboard drying her hands on her apron. I know. I just don't know what else to think. I don't either. Ellen sighed heavily, looking around the kitchen. I guess we need to find something to sell. I've looked for a job in town, but it takes both of us to get all the milking done. We only need to be able to find enough money for food for the next two weeks, and then we'll get paid again. Ellen rested her hand against her stomach, which was still hungry despite just having eaten. There was so little food left, she tended to take small portions for herself claiming to not be hungry, so Melinda wouldn't have to go without. Melinda looked out the open window with the blue-checked curtains that fluttered in the June breeze. There's someone here in a fancy black carriage. Both sisters removed their aprons and stepped outside. Ellen brushed her hair away from her face and looked up at the tall middle-aged man in front of her. His salt and pepper hair was groomed immaculately. May I help you, she asked. Are you Ellen and Melinda Bronson? Both girls nodded. Yes, sir, Melinda answered. I'm Jacob Baxter. He brushed some dust off of his immaculate black suit as if he were too good to even be standing on a farm. They stared at him blankly for a moment. He seemed to think they'd know who he was so Ellen said, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. She did know he wasn't someone she liked, though. He obviously thought he was much better than she and her sister. I'm the manager of the bank in Beckham. Your father never mentioned me? The sisters exchanged a quick look. Never, Ellen responded. What is he doing here? And how did he know my father? He surely would have mentioned if he'd had business with the bank in town. I was afraid of that. Your father took out a loan a few months back to buy some more cattle. Did he mention that to you? No, sir. Ellen looked at the man skeptically. Do you have proof? 
He pulled a document out of the briefcase on the front seat of the carriage. Everything is right here. You'll see he signed it at the bottom. Ellen skimmed over the document which said the farm and everything on it would revert to the bank in the case of John Bronson's death. Why would he sign this? Her eyes met the banker's. Everything reverts to the bank? What about our house? Our furniture? Our mother's things? The man shrugged. It all belongs to the bank now and has for two weeks. We've allowed you to stay so you had time to make other arrangements. I gather you haven't done that? He looked disgusted that the two young women hadn't done anything to plan for their future. Ellen shook her head. We had no idea we should make other arrangements. May we have another week or two? What they could do in that amount of time, she had no idea, but it would be something. Mr. Baxter sighed. I've already given you longer than I should have. He looked around at the rundown farm. I'll tell you what. It's Tuesday. You can have until Friday to find somewhere to go, but then I'll have to take possession. I'll even let you keep your clothes. Nothing else, though. He climbed into the buggy to leave, obviously not caring how they felt about having three days to leave the only home they'd ever known. Three days isn't enough time. Ellen cried in exasperation. It's all you have. Good day. He picked up the reins and drove back toward Beckham. Ellen looked at Melinda. What do we do now? Melinda sighed. We need to find jobs and a place to live. We're old enough to work for wages. She kicked a rock toward the house. I don't want to lose you. You won't lose me. We'll find a way to stay close enough to see each other. Ellen took a deep breath to prepare mentally for the task at hand. Well, there's no time like the present. Let's go change into our Sunday dresses and go to town. Where will we go? What's the best way to find a job? Ellen stepped back into the house. We'll go to the mercantile, because there are often notices for employment there, and we can pick up the paper. Maybe there will be something there. She paused after climbing the stairs and looked at her sister. I would like us to find something we can do together if possible. I don't want to lose the only family I have left. Melinda hugged her sister. I don't either. We'll find something together. I know we can. Both quickly changed and washed their hands and faces before making the short walk into town. When they reached the mercantile, they went to the back of the store where the notices of people trying to sell things and people looking for employees were posted. The two sisters scanned through all the notes and found nothing. They picked up a copy of the free paper and took it out to a bench in front of the store sitting on the boardwalk and watching the wagons and buggies drive by on the unpaved street in front of them. Ellen found the help-wanted section of the paper, and since it was only two columns, read it silently, planning to read aloud if she saw something helpful. She reached the end of the column and sighed. There are no jobs. Only one thing that may be helpful, but I don't think so. She made a face, not wanting to really consider the one thing. Well, something is better than nothing. Read it, and we'll decide together what to do. Melinda looked at her sister eagerly, obviously hoping for something wonderful. Ellen looked back down at the advertisement and read softly, Mail Order Bride Agency needs women who are looking for the adventure of their lives. Men out west need women to marry. Reply in person at 300, Rock Creek Road. See Mrs. Harriet Long. Melinda looked at Ellen in surprise. Mail Order Brides? Papa said we shouldn't marry until we were 21. Ellen nodded. I know, but I don't think we have a choice. Let's go talk to Mrs. Long and see what she says. I don't see how she could possibly find us somewhere to go in just three days, but we'll see what happens. It's better than sitting here wondering what to do. Ellen really had no desire to be a mail-order bride, because she was sure she couldn't find a man who would let her bring her younger sister along. The sisters stood and walked to Rock Creek Road talking about the possibility. We can't stay together if we become mail-order brides. 
Melinda protested. I thought of that, but maybe there will be two men in the same area looking for wives. If we live within an hour or two drive of each other, we'd at least be able to see each other on occasion. What do you think the chances of that are? Ellen laughed softly. Probably next to nothing, but it's worth a try. Anything is worth a try, right? Ellen's voice was desperately as she pled with her sister to at least try to talk to the woman from the ad. They stopped short when they saw the house at the address. It was a huge brick house with large white columns in the front. Wow. She's rich. Melinda wanted to bite her tongue after saying the words, but since she'd only said them to Ellen, they weren't terribly rude. Ellen grinned at her sister. Maybe Mrs. Long is the cook. She started to walk up the sidewalk toward the door. She was nervous, but standing on the street staring at the house would only add to the nerves. She had always believed in doing what needed to be done quickly like taking a big dose of medicine. Melinda followed her sister up to the door. You know as well as I do Mrs. Long isn't the cook. Ellen reached out and grabbed the door knocker bringing it down twice sharply. She put a hand over her stomach to still the butterflies and waited patiently. Within moments the door was pulled open. May I help you? The tall dark-haired man at the door looked like he'd never smiled in his life. Ellen swallowed hard. I'm Ellen Bronson, and this is my sister, Melinda. We're here to see Mrs. Long. The man gave one brief nod and opened the door wide. If you'll just follow me, please? They followed him through the hallway. There was a staircase leading up to the second floor, but they walked around it toward the back of the house. He opened a door at the end of the hall and said, Mrs. Long? There are two young ladies here to see you. They are both Miss Bronson. The woman in the room got to her feet gracefully, walking toward them with a pronounced limp. I'm Harriet Long. Come in and make yourselves comfortable. She had blonde hair and warm green eyes. Ellen thought she looked like she was in her late twenties, but she wasn't certain. Thank you. Ellen headed toward the couch, leaving the chair behind the desk for Mrs. Long. It was where she'd been sitting, and she obviously had a great deal of work to do, because the desk was piled high. Once Ellen and Melinda were seated on the sofa, and Mrs. Long was in front of the desk, the man asked, Would you care for refreshments? Please bring us some lemonade and some cookies if there are some fresh. Thank you, Higgins. Mrs. Long faced the two young ladies and waited for one of them to say something as the man nodded regally and shut the door. Ellen cleared her throat before beginning. We're interested in your advertisement in the paper for mail order brides. Mrs. Long nodded. I'd surmised as much. How old are you? I'm twenty, and my sister is nineteen. Old enough to marry, then. Good. I won't send out a young lady under the age of 18. Just one of my own little rules. Mrs. Long turned to her desk and set out a piece of paper and a pen. After dipping her pen in the pot of ink, she asked, Why do you want to be mail-order brides? Ellen and Melinda exchanged a look, and Ellen briefly wondered how much of the truth she should tell. She wouldn't lie to the woman, of course, but she didn't need to know the whole story did she? Our father died two weeks ago, and we have no place to go. The bank is going to take possession of the farm and everything on it in three days. We're only allowed to take our clothing. Nothing else. Mrs. Long nodded, not seeming surprised by the story. I understand. She studied the two girls for a moment. Do you both want to become brides? Ellen nodded slowly. We looked for jobs but didn't see anything. We honestly have no idea what else to do. She reached over and gripped Melinda's hand. We'd like to stay close together if possible though. That may be difficult, Mrs. Long began. I get letters from all over. It's not common to get two letters from the same area. She sat back in her chair as if she were thinking. Wait. I got two letters yesterday from brothers in Colorado who are each looking for wives. 
she sorted through different papers on her desk and found the ones she was looking for. She handed both letters to Ellen. Ellen skimmed the first and wrinkled her nose, passing it on to Melinda. The man was a banker, and she had no desire to marry someone who would treat anyone the way she and her sister had been treated that morning. She glanced at the second letter and immediately smiled. This was the letter for her. My name is Wesley Harris. I'm 27 years old and the sheriff of the town of Gammonsville, Colorado. The town is at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. I moved out here with my brother in 1878 hoping to strike gold, but instead, I ended up being the sheriff and my brother opened the town bank. It's a quiet little town I think any woman would love living in. I'm looking for a woman who has never been married. I'd prefer someone who was between 18 and 24, but that's flexible. Mainly I want a woman who isn't afraid of hard work who will take care of my home. I want children, so someone in good health is a necessity. I look forward to receiving a letter from you so we can get to know one another and start a life together. Sincerely, Wesley Harris. Ellen's smile lit up her face as her eyes met Mrs. Long's. He's perfect for me. I want to marry the sheriff. She loved the idea of marrying a man who put his life on the line every day to help others. Wesley Harris was definitely the man for her. Melinda had finished her letter around the same time and nodded. I love the idea of marrying the banker. Ellen made a face. You would. Her sister would make a good wife for a rich man. Ellen was positive the banker was made for her. Melinda sighed. I don't ever want to be poor again. We're losing the only home we've ever had. I can't imagine how anyone would choose not to marry a man with money. Mrs. Long smiled at the sisters. So do you want to respond to their letters? Her voice and tone told Ellen that even though this was obviously a business for her, she cared about the women she sent west. Ellen nodded. How long does the whole process take? We have three days to get out of our house. Is there any way we can leave in that amount of time? Mrs. Long stared at them both for a moment before responding. Normal process time is around two months, depending on how quickly the men respond and how many letters are exchanged before you go. Colorado letters take around three weeks, so we're looking at a minimum of six weeks. Ellen stood up. I think we're wasting your time. Thanks for speaking with us. She gave a longing look to the letter she'd set down on the table in front of the sofa. She'd like the man who'd written the letter and would have loved to have been able to meet him and marry him. They couldn't wait six weeks, though. It just wasn't possible. They'd have to find something else, and every minute they spent talking to Mrs. Long was a wasted minute. Melinda sat looking between Ellen and Mrs. Long as if she were trying to decide whether to go with Ellen or try to find some way to marry the man who'd written the letter in her hand. Mrs. Long seemed to think about the situation for a moment as she watched the two girls. I have a proposition for you. This house is much too big for me. I have plenty of space for the two of you to stay with me. I've also got so much work to do with my business that I'm falling behind. I've considered hiring someone to help me, but after the month it would take to catch up, there would only be an hour or so per day of work, and no one is looking for a job for one day per week. So, if you will, stay with me and in exchange for room and board, help me catch up my work. Ellen bit her lip as she considered. She knew Mrs. Long was basically offering them charity, but at that point, she didn't see any other choices. Maybe they could find other ways to help out as well. She nodded slowly. We'd be happy to do that. I think we need to do more than just help with your business, though. Is there anything else we could do to earn our keep? Sit down, and we'll talk about it. If I run out of work for you to do, we'll come up with something. Ellen resumed her seat on the couch and looked down at the letter. He does sound perfect for me. Mrs. Long, who had risen to her feet when Ellen did, sank slowly into her chair obviously favoring one leg. Let's write some letters then, shall we? She handed them each a piece of paper and a pen, putting a small pot of ink between them. 
I'd like you to include age, occupation if there is one, a brief description of yourself, and any hobbies you may have. Both of the sisters put pen to paper and began writing. Ellen thought for a moment after writing the salutation, trying to decide exactly what she wanted to tell him. Dear Wesley, I was thrilled to receive your letter. I'm 20 years old and live on the outskirts of Beckham, Massachusetts where I've lived my entire life. I was raised on a small dairy farm and enjoy being around animals. I like the idea of living in a small town near the Rocky Mountains. I've only ever seen paintings of mountains and love the idea of seeing one in person. I have kept house for my father since my mother died when I was 12, so I'm more than capable of cooking and cleaning for you. I love the idea of having a house full of children. I'm in good health. My sister is answering the letter your brother sent. We love the idea of being mail-order brides, but living close together. I enjoy reading and taking long walks. I hope to hear from you soon. Yours, Ellen. Ellen set the pen down and handed the letter to Mrs. Long, is that what you're looking for? Mrs. Long quickly read through the letter and then nodded. It's perfect. Ellen watched as her sister wrote quickly trying to finish her own letter. Finally, Melinda looked up and handed it to Mrs. Long as well. How's that? Good. Mrs. Long folded both letters and set them aside. We'll get them mailed out first thing in the morning. She looked up as Higgins came into the room with the lemonade and cookies she'd requested. He set the tray in front of her and she poured them each a glass, and set the plate with the cookies on it between them. Thank you, Higgins. Ellen picked up the glass of lemonade and took a sip of the tart liquid. She and Melinda had cut back to cooking one meal per day in hopes they could make the food last, so she was thankful for the cookies. She reached out and took one and smiled. These are good. She counted the cookies on the plate and divided mentally by three wondering how many she could eat without looking like a glutton. Mrs. Long smiled as Higgins shut the door behind him. My cook is wonderful. She took a cookie for herself as the girls settled back onto the couch to enjoy the small snack. Do you girls have what you need to stay at the farm for the rest of the week, or do you just want to move in here tomorrow? She gestured to the pile of letters on her desk. I could use the help. Ellen looked at Melinda. If they went home, they wouldn't be able to eat. It made more sense to move immediately. What do you think, Melinda? Melinda tilted her head to the side in a way that told Ellen she was thinking about it. I think we should go ahead and move right away. I don't want to be there when they come to take all of our things away. Ellen hadn't thought about how hard that would be. Of course, since she'd been giving most of the food to Melinda, she was thinking more with her stomach than her emotions. She squeezed Melinda's hand. Why don't we come back in the morning then? Would that be okay? Mrs. Long nodded. We'll be thrilled to have you. Once they'd polished off the cookies and lemonade, Ellen stood. We'll pack our things this evening and be back around 10 tomorrow morning. Would that be okay? She considered for a moment all the work Mrs. Long said she had for them. Is that early enough? Mrs. Long stood and walked them toward the door. That would be wonderful. I'll enjoy having company for a while. Ellen smiled at the older woman. Thank you so much for your hospitality. We truly appreciate the help you're giving us. She shook Mrs. Long's hand. We'll work hard. I promise. I know you will. I'll see you in the morning. Closing the door behind them, she called Higgins. We're going to be having some guests for a while. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Ellen baked the last of the cornbread that evening and as they ate it, they talked about the letters. I love the idea of marrying a banker. Melinda gushed. Just imagine not having to worry about money. And he said he has a cook and someone who cleans. I'd have all the time I wanted to read books and just keep to myself. He's going to be perfect for me. Melinda's eyes danced with excitement at the prospect of marrying her banker. Ellen sighed. 
Don't you think it's more important that he be a good person than he make a lot of money? The sheriff sounds like the kind of man I'm looking for. He wouldn't put his life on the line every day if he didn't think helping others was important. Her sister had never been materialistic, but she hated all of her time being taken up by chores. It had been better before their father died, because then they were only doing the housework and not all of the farm work as well. Maybe. I'm glad you're the one marrying him, though. I'm tired of housework. You can have it all. Melinda waved her arm as if to encompass the entire house full of work she was gifting to her sister. I'd gladly do housework every day of my life if it meant I didn't have to marry a man who would kick grieving people out of the only home they've ever known. How could you even think of marrying a banker after what happened this morning? Ellen was stunned at her sister's attitude. Sure, housework wasn't the most fun thing to do in the world, but it was better than sitting idle while the man you were married to was out being cruel to others. How could you even think of not marrying the richest man you can find after what happened this morning? Melinda shook her head in confusion. Ellen shook her head at her younger sister. I think we'll have to agree to disagree on this one. She stood up. Let's get these dishes done so we can go pack our things. Before they went to bed that evening, everything the sisters owned was in a huge trunk. It was good they were going to the same place, because there was only one. In the back of her mind, Ellen felt bad for taking the trunk after being told they could only take their clothing, but she knew they simply didn't have a choice unless they wanted to walk down the streets of Beckham with their drawers in their arms. She wasn't willing to make that kind of spectacle of herself, though. When Ellen prayed that night, she thanked God for bringing Harriet long into their lives. She was truly their guardian angel. She went to sleep with a smile on her lips as she thought about the good man she'd marry. Any man who cared enough for others to do a job where he must risk his life on a daily basis was one she had to admire. Chapter 2 Wesley Harris walked into his brother's house without knocking as usual. It drove Patrick's housekeeper crazy, but he just didn't care. He went to the office his brother kept at home at the back of the house, knowing he'd find his brother there. He tended to work eight hours per day at the bank and another four when he got home. Wesley was glad he had two deputies to take over when he was ready to go home for the day. He just wasn't as dedicated to working all the time as his brother. Wesley and Patrick were both tall with dark hair and brown eyes. Patrick was slimmer, due to sitting behind a desk all day, while Wesley was muscular from the regular physical work he did. Wesley was more handsome than Patrick and had a ready charm about him that many women found irresistible. He flirted with all women he met, young or old, married or single. He always knew just the right words to say to draw women out of their shell. Got my letter today, Wesley announced without greeting his brother. He held up the letter he'd received from a young lady named Ellen Bronson in Becca, Massachusetts. I did too. Patrick pushed aside the work in front of him to give his brother his undivided attention. They were as close as two such different men could be. The years they'd grown up together and the trip out to Colorado had made them close. Their time working their gold mines together had cemented their bond. The woman who answered mine is Ellen. She said her sister was writing to you. Wesley stood for a moment looking around the room. His handgun was worn casually at his side as if it was just another item of clothing. Melinda said her sister was writing to you. Patrick leaned back in his chair with his hands forming a steeple in front of him as he studied his younger brother. Wesley flopped down on the sofa. So what's Melinda like? Patrick shrugged. She just said she's 19 and recently lost her father. She's from Massachusetts and is the daughter of a dairy farmer. She enjoys entertaining and reading. She plays the piano. Sounds like she'll be a good wife for me. I need someone who can be the hostess when I give a dinner party. Wesley nodded. She sounds interesting. Ellen wrote that she's kept house for her father since her mother died eight years ago and she wants a lot of kids. She'll work. At this point, I'm just ready to not be alone anymore. He wanted a lot from a wife. 
Sure, like most men he had physical urges he needed seen to, but he also wanted someone to help him keep his house clean. He needed someone to cook meals for him so he didn't have to burn his own, and he loved the idea of having someone to talk to over the dinner table. He'd eaten way too many lonely meals in the time he'd been sheriff of their small town. It would be nice if the face across the table from his was pretty, but he didn't consider that a requirement. Patrick sighed as he leaned back in his chair. I know how you feel. I think she could have green hair and orange eyes at this point, and I'd still marry her. It's time. He rubbed his hand over the back of his neck, trying to rub out some of the tension he felt from the hours he spent bent over his desk every day. Wesley looked around at the immaculate office. Everything around Patrick was always immaculate. It drove Wesley crazy. Wesley's house was slightly messy and definitely needed a woman's touch. Patrick's housekeeper kept his house running like a well-oiled machine. Nothing was ever out of place. Are you going to send her a train ticket? Patrick nodded. Of course. I'm ready for her to get here so we can start our lives together. He paused, his eyes meeting his brother's. What about you? Wesley nodded. I'll have to wait until Friday when I get paid, but I'll definitely send off for her. He wished he had the money then, because he was so very tired of being alone, but in the great scheme of things, what did a few days matter? Why don't I send someone to Denver to buy the train tickets tomorrow? That way we can both send the letters off on Wednesday. I don't mind paying for my future sister-in-law's ticket. Patrick's voice was steady, and even as he offered. He'd do anything for his brother, and it was written on his face. He just wished he'd let him give him some of the money they dug out of his claim together. Wesley looked at his brother for a moment considering, but then nodded. Sure. You have the money, so why not? When the brothers had arrived in Colorado, they'd each stake their own claim. Patrick had struck gold immediately, and he'd paid Wesley to help him mine. They'd tried to work Wesley's together once Patrick's was played out, but there had been no gold there. When Patrick had wanted to open a bank, he'd been worried about the lawlessness of the area in general, so Wesley had become the lawman. It had worked out well for both brothers. Wesley had a modest home near the jail that he was happy in. He always told Patrick he would go crazy in a house that was as neat as Patrick's always was. There was a knock at the study door. Would you like refreshments? Mrs. Smith asked the two men. Patrick raised an eyebrow in question. Wesley grinned at the housekeeper. How about feeding me dinner, he asked. Mrs. Smith just smiled. Of course. It'll be ready in an hour. Do you need something before then? The smile on her face showed her like for the younger man. Wesley winked at the older woman to watch her squirm. Do you have any chocolate cake sitting around? Mrs. Smith laughed. Alice baked a fresh cake this morning. Would you like a slice now, or for dessert? Yes, I would. Wesley's biggest downfall was his sweet tooth. He walked everywhere around town, because he had to burn off all the sweets he ate somehow. Which one? Now and for dessert, of course. His eyes pled with her to give him what she wanted, knowing she would. Mrs. Smith shook her head as she headed for the door. You should be fat, Mr. Wesley. Wesley grinned and turned back to Patrick. I'm staying for dinner. One less night he'd have to eat alone and cook for himself. Patrick's cook was excellent, and he found a way to finagle dinner at his brother's house at least twice a week. More if he could think up a plausible reason for it. Patrick sighed. I caught that. You don't want me to stay? Wesley did his best to look offended as he stared at his brother. But I'm your favorite brother. I don't mind you staying to dinner. I think you need to stop trying to romance my 60-year-old housekeeper, though. And you're my only brother. Wesley stretched out his legs in front of him. Even grandmas need love, Pat. Patrick shook his head hoping being married would force his brother to be more serious. 
Maybe once the children arrived he'd realize there was more to life than just fun and games. I'm glad we're going to marry sisters. It will be nice to have wives who get along well and like to spend time together. Wesley nodded. That's true. We probably couldn't have handpicked better responses to our letters. I just hope they hurry. He rubbed his hands together anxiously. Soon it would happen. Patrick smiled. So do I. Just think. In another five weeks, we could be married. I know you like that idea. I wouldn't be here for dinner so much if I had someone to cook for me. Patrick raised an eyebrow. You wouldn't? I thought you were eating at my house to save yourself some money. Wesley shrugged. Well, that too. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Ellen hurried to the post office, one of the daily chores that had been hers since she and Melinda had moved in with Harriet. Melinda preferred to help file the letters Harriet received and leave any actual activity to Ellen. Ellen didn't mind, though. She wanted to do as much for Harriet as she possibly could to pay her back for her hospitality. She waited her turn at the post office and received a handful of letters addressed to Harriet. There were two, though, that were addressed to Ellen and Melinda Care of Harriet. Those were the letters that truly excited Ellen. She thought about tearing hers open right there in the post office, but decided she should wait until she got back to Harriet's house. She walked as quickly as she could through the streets to get back to Harriet's house. She almost broke into a run once, but reminded herself that ladies don't run through town. She rushed into the house and back into the study where Melinda was enjoying a lemonade and cookie break while Harriet continued her work. She shook her head at her sister, wishing she had the same kind of work ethic she did. How could they have been raised by the same parents? We got our responses today, Harriet. She handed the older woman the letters with a huge grin on her face. She was practically dancing in place as she waited for the other woman to read them. You haven't opened yours yet? Harriet asked in surprise. I don't know that I could have restrained myself. Ellen shook her head. I wasn't sure if you needed to read them first. Of course not. I wouldn't read your mail. She gave Ellen the letters back. Ellen handed the one addressed to Melinda to her sister and sank down onto the sofa with her own. She handed the check included to Harriet and skimmed through the letter. Dear Ellen, I was thrilled to receive your letter. You sound like just what I'm looking for in a wife. Included is your train ticket and some money for your trip out here. My brother and I will stay in my house overnight and will marry the day after you arrive, allowing you and your sister to use his house. We're both very excited at the idea of marrying sisters. Your ticket is for July 18th, which should give you enough time. Yours, Wesley. Ellen looked at the calendar. They had four days before the train left, and the trip would take ten days. She sighed. She hated the idea of being on a train for that long, but was thankful she wouldn't have to be part of a wagon train to go that far. A train ride would be much more pleasant than making the long walk out west. Ellen smiled at Melinda who was clutching her own train ticket. She'd always wanted to go on a train, but their family had never had enough money to be able to do it. Are you excited? She loved the spark in her younger sister's eyes at the idea of a train trip. Melinda nodded with a smile. I can't wait. Ellen looked at the money in her hand for the trip. Harriet had loaned them both money to make some dresses before the trip, and though she was thankful, she'd hated taking anything more from the sweet woman. She counted out the money and handed Harriet a little over half of what she had. She could eat less on the trip so she'd have the money to pay her back more. Melinda made a face, but counted out some money for Harriet as well. Thank you for buying the fabric for us so we could make our dresses. I'm thrilled we've gotten as much done as we have, Ellen told her. There's no way we would have been able to make wedding dresses in the three days we have before we leave for Colorado. Harriet pushed the money back into their hands. It was payment for all the work you've done. Both of you have done a wonderful job here. 
she looked at Ellen as she said the words. Ellen had looked for work every day while Melinda had found reasons to take breaks. I can't accept that. You gave us food and a place to live. Ellen offered the money again. Harriet shook her head. Absolutely not. I won't take it. She paused for a moment with a serious look on her face. I really want you to keep it. I'm always worried when I send one of my brides off that they're going into a bad situation. I want you both to promise me something. Ellen's brows drew together. What's that? She'd promise her firstborn child to Harriet for all the help she'd given her. She'd never met such a selfless woman in her life. If you're treated badly at all once you arrive, you'll use that money to come right back here. You can live with me while we find you a job or something you can do. You never have to stay in a relationship where you're being mistreated. The look on Harriet's face told Ellen she was serious about it. Ellen couldn't help but wonder what had happened to make her so worried about her brides. Both of the sisters agreed they wouldn't stay in a bad situation. We'll be close to each other, though, and I'm sure we'll be able to help to one another, Melinda told her. Nothing more was said about the subject then, but Ellen woke in the middle of the night, and when she went downstairs to get some warm milk from the kitchen, she overheard Harriet and Higgins talking. They got their letters today. They'll be leaving for Colorado on the 18th. I'm going to miss them. Ellen smiled as she had Harriet's voice. She was glad they hadn't been a burden on the kind woman. She'd been worried that Melinda would have annoyed the woman with her constant breaks, but it sounded as if Harriet had simply enjoyed them both. They never should have been here in the first place, Higgins told her. We don't want anyone here to know what happened. It could ruin your life here if people found out. What if one of them had overheard us talking? Harriet sighed heavily. I know it could. It would be worse for you than for me, though. I hate the idea of anyone finding out that you killed him. Even though the jury found you not guilty, the stigma would be enough to cause people to treat you badly. I shot him in defense of you. If I'd known it was happening sooner, I'd have killed him sooner. It's good it happened like it did, because I was able to claim I was protecting you. I'd have killed him in cold blood otherwise. Higgins' voice was loud and clear as it rang out throughout the room. I appreciate your feelings. I'm just glad you were there that day. I think he was about to kill me. The obvious fear in Harriet's voice sent a chill through Ellen. Higgins' voice was bleak when he said, he crippled you for life. I would like to kill him again when I think of how I felt as you bounced down those stairs. I promised your father I would protect you, and I didn't. That's enough. Let's not speak of it. I need to get to sleep. She yawned audibly. I know you'll be pleased when the girls are gone, but I'll miss them. They've been good friends to me. I wish we didn't have to hide what happened. Then you could have friends around you more often. Ellen had heard enough. She hurried up the stairs without her milk. She stared at the ceiling through the night as she hurt for her friend. She'd known Harriet was a widow, but when the other woman didn't want to talk about her husband, she didn't press things assuming she was still mourning him. Now she knew why she didn't want to talk. Poor Harriet. Ellen hoped that someday she'd find love. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. On the morning of their departure, Ellen and Melinda thanked Harriet repeatedly for her hospitality. Ellen had said nothing about what she'd overheard the night they'd received the letters, but she found herself observing Harriet more than ever. It seemed hard to believe the sweet woman had lived through the type of marriage she'd overheard her talking about. Harriet walked with them to the train station, providing them each with sandwiches to make it through the first day. You'll have to buy food after today, but I can at least help with the first day's meals. I want to tell you again how much we appreciate you helping us find husbands and giving us a place to stay until it was time to leave. I don't know what we'd have done if you hadn't helped. You were our guardian angel. Ellen walked slowly beside Harriet, making sure her stride was matched to the lame woman's. Melinda smiled sweetly. Yes, thank you so much. 
I don't think I could ever tell you how much you've helped us. At the train station, they all hugged. Goodbye. Anne Melinda and Ellen promised to write as soon as they arrived in Colorado. The worry in Harriet's eyes as they left was obvious. Ellen would have wondered why if she hadn't overheard the conversation she did, but she understood now. Harriet worried about anyone going into a marriage. Ellen wondered why she'd gone into the mail-order bride business if she was so worried about abusive marriages. We'll write soon and often, Ellen promised. I'll miss having you two with me. I'm going to have to work hard to keep up with all my work without my special helpers. Their train was called then and Harriet watched them board. If they'd turned around, they'd have seen the tears in her eyes as she watched them go. Chapter 3 Ellen stretched in her seat, rubbing the back of her neck. I'm so glad we're almost there. I feel like we've been on this thing for years. The two sisters sat next to one another taking turns watching out the window. Melinda had brought some books for them to read, but they'd both found that reading while the train was moving caused them to become queasy. Melinda nodded. I thought riding on a train would be some grand adventure, but really, it's just a dirty place. I'm ready to be there. She leaned her head against the window, because it was her turn to look out, and she wanted to see every last detail of the state that would be their new home. Are you nervous about meeting Patrick? Ellen asked. Melinda shrugged. A little, but not terribly. I know I'm going into the situation I need to be in. I mean, what more could I ask for than a man with a lot of money who can take care of me for the rest of my life? Ellen sighed. She could see her sister truly believed there was nothing more important in life than having enough money to live well. She knew Melinda would eventually learn better, and she hoped it would happen soon. You could ask for a good kind-hearted man who helps others. Like the one I'm getting. You can have the good man. I want the rich one. Melinda didn't even turn her head from the window as she made the pronouncement. Do you have any idea how you sound? Ellen was appalled that her sister could even talk that way, let alone believe what she was saying. Melinda sighed. You know I don't mean it. I just can't stand the idea of being in the kind of situation we were in before with no money and nowhere to go. That really scared me. I know. Ellen squeezed her sister's hand. It scared me, too. She hoped her sister would be able to refrain from making the kind of statement she'd made to her over and over since they'd begun their journey in front of her future husband. She didn't want him to think Melinda was only marrying him for his wealth. You should be really careful what you say around Patrick, you know. He may think you're only marrying him because of his wealth. Melinda nodded. You're right. I'll watch what I say. The train began slowing down, and the conductor called out their stop. The sisters waited for the train to stop moving before they stood to get off. Ellen wondered how they'd find the right men, but decided they'd figure it out once they were off the train. They slowly went to the front of the passenger car and down the steps. Standing on the platform, Ellen scanned the crowd hoping she'd see the men they were waiting for. She reached out to squeeze her sister's hand to give them both a bit of confidence as they waited to meet the men they'd spend the rest of their lives with. After a minute two tall dark-haired men approached them. They were each wearing slacks, white shirts and vests. Ellen's eyes zeroed in on the slimmer of the two men. As their eyes met, she felt a tingle in her belly. That must be Wesley. She stepped forward, offering her hand to him. I'm so glad to finally meet you, she said. His hand gripped hers, not too hard, but solidly. She couldn't believe how drawn she was to him. His brown eyes seemed to sparkle in the sunlight. He smiled. It's nice to meet you. I've been looking forward to your arrival. He tucked her hand into his arm and walked with her toward the buggy. Wow, he thought. He wasn't sure what he'd expected, but the beautiful woman walking beside him passed his every expectation. She walked with him, forgetting all about their trunk. After a moment, she stopped short. Our trunk. 
he would think she was silly, forgetting something so important because she'd been lost in his brown eyes. He laughed. I guess it should have occurred to me that you'd have luggage. I was so lost in your beauty, I wasn't thinking straight. Ellen blushed. She'd never been called a beauty before. Was he just trying to flatter her or was he being sincere? She pointed toward the platform. I can see they just unloaded it. She walked back toward the platform, still clinging to his arm. Ellen could see Melinda off in the distance being helped into a buggy. When they reached the platform, he put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a coin. Would you be willing to deliver that to the black buggy over there, he asked, indicating the buggy. The uniformed man nodded. Right away, sir. Ellen and the man walked slowly back toward the buggy. I'm glad you were able to get the day off to come get us, she whispered. She'd never seen a man as handsome as he was. He was dressed immaculately, and his brown eyes seemed to dance as they looked down at her. He smiled. I wouldn't have missed it. Once they reached the buggy, he handed her up into the front seat beside him. She could see that Melinda was already sitting happily in the back seat. Ellen turned and smiled at the man sitting beside her sister. Just because he was a banker didn't mean she should treat him poorly. You must be Patrick. The man blinked twice then laughed. I'm Wesley. You're sitting next to Patrick. He shook his head. Please tell me you're Melinda. Ellen blushed. She'd been so focused on the man she hadn't bothered to learn his name, just immediately assuming he was Wesley. She looked at Patrick. You're Patrick? I'm Ellen. She bit her lip. Now what? She'd come out here not necessarily thinking she'd meet a man she was attracted to, but certain love could come on its own. Now that she'd met them, she knew she didn't want to marry Wesley. She wasn't attracted to him at all. The shocked look on Melinda's face told her she felt the same way about Patrick. Ellen looked back at Melinda. Should we switch places then? Melinda's eyes were wide and confused. She looked from Patrick to Wesley. We can ride where we are. We'll figure it all out when we get there. Ellen nodded and sat back in her seat. What did she have to say to a banker? How many people have you evicted from their homes today? Patrick looked at Ellen just as surprised as she was. He'd seen her and immediately known she was the woman he'd been waiting for. There was something in her eyes that told him he needed to spend the rest of his life with her. For whatever reason, she seemed to be wary of him now that she knew he was Patrick and not Wesley. Did that mean she hadn't wanted to marry him for some reason and had deliberately passed his letter on to her sister? And if that was the case, was there some way to convince her that he was the man she'd come out here to marry and not his brother? Well, Ellen, I didn't get a chance to read your letters. Tell me about yourself. What do you like to do with your spare time? He began maneuvering the carriage through the busy streets of Denver listening carefully for her response. Ellen shrugged. I've honestly never had a lot of spare time. I like to read and go for walks. I enjoy sewing. Patrick smiled. I love to read and go for long walks. I'm not much on sewing, though. He watched out of the corner of his eye to see how she'd react to his words. Ellen laughed. Most men aren't much on sewing. She paused, almost afraid to talk to him knowing he was meant for her sister. I hate bankers, she blurted out. As soon as she spoke, she raised her hand to cover her mouth. How could she have said something like that to him? Really? Why? When our father died, just two months ago, he was in debt and we never knew it. After his death, a banker came and told us we had to get out. I was able to talk him into letting us stay for three days, but I could never respect a man who kicked people out of their homes. Patrick smiled ruefully. Neither could I. I'm the worst banker alive, he confided in a whisper. I always give people more and more time. I have one family who hasn't paid a dime in a year, and they still live in their house. 
In fact, I sent my housekeeper over with a meal just last night because I heard the mother was sick. He shook his head as if disgusted with himself. If I were a good banker, I would never do anything like that. How can you make a living that way? She stared at him in surprise. He shrugged. I do okay. Most of my money came from my gold claim, and I just break even on the bank. Ellen smiled at him. Seriously? He nodded. Seriously. She felt a lot more at ease with him, knowing that, and they passed the time chatting happily about their favorite books. He told her about the places he'd seen on their trip from Missouri where he'd been born and raised. By the time they'd arrived in Gammonville, Ellen felt as if she'd known him her entire life. She couldn't hear what Melinda and Wesley were talking about, but every once in a while she'd hear laughter coming from the back seat, and she knew they were getting along every bit as well as she and Patrick were. After they pulled up in front of Patrick's house, Ellen went inside with Melinda while the men brought the trunk inside. Ellen spoke to Melinda in a low voice. I'm attracted to Patrick. Melinda nodded. I could tell. I'm attracted to Wesley. It's too bad you're marrying Wesley and I'm marrying Patrick. Ellen bit her lip. How would you feel about switching? I could marry Patrick and you could marry Wesley. Patrick is someone I could love but I don't think I could ever love Wesley. Not as anything more than a brother. Melinda tilted her head to the side while she thought about it. But Wesley is poor. He's just a sheriff. Ellen sighed. I know that. But don't you think you should be attracted to the man you marry and not just his money? Ellen said a quick prayer her sister would listen to her and finally understand her words. They'd had this discussion over and over, and Melinda hadn't wavered. Melinda frowned. I really like Wesley, but I'm afraid of being poor. You know if Wesley ever has financial problems, his brother is a banker, right? I'm sure Patrick wouldn't let his brother live on the streets. You don't even know him yet. How can you say that with such certainty? Ellen wanted to scream. Why don't we do this? We'll give it some time. We'll ask them to give us a month to see who we want to marry. I know that Wesley is attracted to you and Patrick is attracted to me. I'm sure they'll agree to it. Melinda nodded somewhat reluctantly. That makes sense. I need to know if I could fall in love with Patrick before I marry him. She looked anxious about making the decision, but Ellen was relieved and didn't give her time to reconsider. Do you think they'll be angry with us? Melinda shrugged. Probably not. I mean, they want to be happy in their marriages too, right? When the men were finished carrying the trunk upstairs, the four of them sat down in the parlor. We have something we'd like to ask you, Ellen began. What's the best way to say this without hurting any feelings or making them angry? Patrick smiled. Certainly. Patrick's smile reached his eyes, and Ellen found herself almost mesmerized by it. We'd like to have some time to get to know you. I'm sure you noticed that we both automatically paired off with the wrong person. Would you be willing to put off the weddings until we know each other better and can decide who we think we'd be better matched with? Please say yes, she prayed. Patrick frowned slightly. How long are you asking for? He didn't look thrilled at the idea of waiting, but he didn't look like he was going to reject them outright either. Ellen looked at Melinda who nodded slightly. A month. Patrick shook his head. No. That's too long. How about two days? Ellen gasped in shock. That won't work. We'd have no time to get to know either of you. How about three weeks? She'd always enjoyed bargaining, and by the look on Patrick's face, she could see he was enjoying the negotiations. Three days. Ellen folded her arms across her chest. That's unreasonable. Two weeks? She wasn't going to go lower than a week. Anything less than that was absolutely ridiculous. One week, Wesley suggested. 
That gives us all time to get to know one another a little better and to decide whom we want to marry, but it doesn't make us feel like you're trying to put off the marriage forever. Ellen really looked at Wesley for the first time then. He wasn't dressed quite as properly as Patrick was, and seemed to have a much more laid-back nature than his brother. He was handsome, but she didn't find him nearly as attractive as Patrick. Ellen leaned over toward Melinda. Are you okay, with one week? She felt the length of time was reasonable, but she couldn't agree to anything without her sister's consent. Melinda nodded. I don't think we're going to be able to talk them into anything more than that. Ellen nodded slowly. One week. Patrick sighed. A week it is. Not a day more. He stood up and pulled Ellen to her feet and out a side door that led into a pretty little garden. The garden seemed to go all the way around the corner of the house to the back, and she couldn't help but wonder what else was back there. Why did you bring me out here? She looked up at him and then, for the first time realized he was much taller than she was. What was she getting herself into? We made a bargain. If you were a man, we'd shake hands on it. You're a lady, so we'll kiss on it. His warm brown eyes were suddenly burning as they stared into her own. She stared up at him with wide eyes. Kiss on it? She'd never before kissed a man. He pulled her toward him by the hand he gripped leaning down to brush a kiss across her lips. He'd meant to keep it light, but as soon as their lips touched, he felt a spark go through his body. She wrapped her arms around his neck and let his tongue part her lips. She'd never imagined she could feel something like this by kissing a man. His hands roamed down her back over her green dress and pulled her closer against him. Her breasts were flattened against his hard chest. He shouldn't be holding me so close. She tore her lips from his and stared up at him, her chest heaving. It's not proper for you to kiss me that way. We're not married. She didn't really know if there was a proper way for a man to kiss a woman before they were married, but his kiss felt improper. We will be, he whispered, brushing a soft sweet kiss across her lips. I want to marry you. She nodded. I want to marry you as well, but you're engaged to my sister and I'm engaged to your brother. We need to wait and see how they feel about it. If they had been the only people involved, she'd have happily gone before a preacher that very moment, but she couldn't risk other people's happiness as well. He took her hand and led her back into the house. By the blush on Melinda's face, and the slight swelling of her lips, as well as the fact Wesley now sat beside her on the couch, she could tell that he'd kissed her as well. She only hoped she'd find a way to convince her sister she belonged with Wesley. Whatever she thought, there was no way Melinda should marry Patrick. Patrick sat in an overstuffed chair across from the sofa and Melinda sat in the chair Wesley had vacated. Okay, one week. We have dinner together every evening? Patrick asked. Ellen nodded. We need to spend as much time together as we can. She couldn't take her eyes off of him during the discussion. What would it be like to be married to him? Worse, what would it be like to be married to his brother and know he was married to her sister? She had to convince Melinda to swap fiancés. Wesley lives a 15-minute walk from here. You girls stay here and we'll stay there. Every evening at 6, we'll come over here and have dinner and talk. Tomorrow night, I'll spend time with Ellen and Wesley will spend time with Melinda. The following night, I'll spend time with Melinda and Wesley with Ellen. Every night we'll swap, but on the seventh night, you need to be prepared to tell us who will marry whom as soon as we arrive. Patrick spoke softly in a reasonable tone as if he'd planned for this all along. Ellen looked across the small coffee table to her sister. What do you think? Melinda nodded. That's fair. Ellen noticed her sister couldn't seem to take her eyes off Wesley. To her, Wesley seemed to be too young to marry. She wondered how old Patrick was. Wesley was six years her senior. She looked at Patrick. How old are you? Twenty-nine. Ellen nodded. It had been in his letter, but she had passed it on quickly after realizing he was a banker. 
I'm 20. The four of them sat talking for a few minutes before Mrs. Smith came into the room. Dinner's ready. Patrick stood and waited for Ellen to precede him from the room. When they got into the dining room, Ellen was in awe. It was a large room with a huge oak table and chairs. The table was set with beautiful china. Wow. Do you eat like this every night? He laughed. Only when I have to give dinner parties, which is thankfully, not too often. I hate them. I would, too. I'm not the most social person in the world. She fumbled to sit down when he held her chair for her. She knew it was considered polite for a man to hold a woman's chair out, but she'd never had a man actually do it for her. Being a part of his life would have her experiencing a lot of things she'd never thought about before. She watched as Wesley held out Melinda's chair and her sister sat down with perfect grace as if she'd not only had her chair held all her life, but she'd expected him to treat her that way. Ellen felt a pang. Melinda had the manners and the temperament to be married to a man of Patrick's status, but she didn't. She should marry Wesley and be the dutiful sheriff's wife, a job she knew she could master quickly. Their meal was a chicken and vegetable soup, followed by chicken pot pie and a chocolate cake for dessert. Patrick watched Ellen throughout the meal, obviously hoping he'd impressed her with his wealth. She wished she could find a way to tell him she didn't care one smidgen about his wealth. It was him she was interested in. As they had since they were picked up at the train depot in Denver, Patrick spoke to only Ellen and Wesley, kept his conversation to Melinda. Neither man was rude to the sister he didn't favor, but it was very obvious they were each as taken with one of the women as the women were with them. Once the meal was over, Patrick asked Ellen to go for a walk with him. She wasn't sure if that was a good idea after the kiss they'd shared in the garden, and in whispered words, she told him so. He laughed. We'll be in public. There's no danger. Wesley and Melinda opted to stay in the house, while Patrick and Ellen went for their walk Ellen was pleased he'd asked her to go. After ten days on a train, she needed to exercise her legs. She couldn't imagine why Melinda was content to sit still. She'd been on the train just as long as Ellen had. Once they were outside, Ellen was thrilled she decided to go. It was chilly. I wish I'd thought to bring a shawl. It's actually cold. He laughed. You'll find the temperature here a lot different than it is in Massachusetts. I think you'll be happy here. His hand reached out and squeezed hers. I hope you'll be happy here. She nodded shyly. I think so too. She turned her head and met his eyes. When I read your letter, I immediately handed it to Melinda, because I had no desire to be a banker's wife. Now that I've met you, I wish I hadn't done that. He wrapped his arm around her shoulders to warm her. I wish you hadn't too. I'd rather marry you tomorrow than a week from now, but I obviously have no choice in the matter. He sounded slightly sad as he said the words, but was obviously not angry with either her or her sister. She sighed. I just hope I can convince Melinda to follow her heart. Are you really worried she'd choose me over Wesley? Why would any woman choose a man she obviously had no affection for over a man she had feelings for? What would make her do that? In some ways. We reacted very differently to the banker coming to remove us from the only home we'd ever known. It made me hate and resent all bankers, but made her vow to never be poor again. She thinks if she marries you, she won't have any more financial worries, and nothing like that could ever happen to her again. I can understand that, but I don't want to give up my chance at happiness just because she's afraid of being poor. I don't think there's any way I could be happy with Wesley. I'm just not attracted to him. She left unspoken how strong her attraction was to Patrick. How could she put that into words? And you are to me? She blushed, happy it was dark and he wouldn't be able to see it. I know I shouldn't admit it, but yes, I am. As soon as I saw you, I knew I wanted to be your wife. I was very disappointed to find out you weren't Wesley. If Melinda wasn't involved, and I asked you to go through with marrying tomorrow, but to marry me, would you do it? 
Ellen nodded slowly. Absolutely. I hated asking you to wait. I tried to talk her into going through the wedding tomorrow with her marrying Wesley and me marrying you and she wouldn't do it. She thinks we need to make sure we know what we're doing first. I think she's trying to decide if her feelings for Wesley are strong enough for her to ignore the fact he doesn't make much money. She wished she could explain how her sister saw things, but she truly didn't understand it herself. Melinda wasn't a bad person, but she was one who let her fears rule her life at times. They had walked the entire length of town by that point. He pointed to a small house. That's where Wesley lives, and where he and I will be staying while you two decide what you'll do. I'm sorry to make you wait. He ran his hand up and down her arm. As long as I know you'll be marrying me in a week, I can wait. She sighed. You understand I can't promise that, right? You'd let your sister's fear of poverty keep you from happiness? Really? His voice was intense as he watched her with his dark eyes, daring her to admit she would go against her sister's wishes. I hope that's not put to the test. I really do. He took her to a small park on the outskirts of town. There was a large wooden swing hanging from a tree that was big enough for two. They sat together holding hands and talking. So you want children, he asked. At least a dozen. She hadn't been around children much, but she enjoyed them. She could picture herself with children surrounding her and could think of nothing she'd rather do with her life. He laughed. There's an orphanage full of kids here in town. He watched her carefully to see her reaction. Let's go pick out a couple. I thought maybe you'd want to spend some time there so you can understand a dozen children might be too many. She thought about that for a moment. I'd like that. You wouldn't mind? You'll have plenty of time. I'll have things for you to do from time to time, like plan one of my dinner parties that we'll both hate going to, but for the most part, you'll have a lot of free time. Housework is done by the housekeeper, and I have a cook. There's really no need for you to do a lot of work around the house. For some reason, he felt that she would be happier if she had more to do. He didn't want to pressure her into anything, but he didn't want her to sit around bored all day either. What about sewing? I have a tailor I use. If you want something for yourself you can either choose to make it or pay someone to do it for you if you'd prefer. She made a face. Sounds like you're looking to pamper me, and I'm not so good with that. I do better when I can work and stay busy. I can see that in you. That's why I brought up the orphanage. There are other things you could become involved with, but I think the orphanage would probably suit you best. She rested her head against his shoulder as they talked. I think you're probably right. I can't believe you already know me so well, and we just met this afternoon. He stroked a tendril of hair that had escaped her bun away from her face. You're exactly the type of woman I was looking for when I sent that letter off. I'm so glad I've found you. His mouth dropped to hers again and he gently kissed her, his hands staying on her shoulders. You can't keep kissing me. What if we don't get married? I'll miss your kisses forever. She knew she was revealing too much about her rapidly growing feelings by saying that, but she couldn't hide her thoughts. He stroked her cheek with the back of his finger. We're getting married. I don't care what it takes. I'm marrying you, not your sister. The more he said it, the faster he'd convince her to throw caution to the wind and just marry him whether their siblings approved or not. She drew away startled. But I'm going to have to spend time with Wesley and get to know him. He nodded. Don't let him kiss you. Just me. His hand cupped the back of her head as he drew her back toward him. You're mine now. Her eyes drifted closed as he brushed his lips across hers again. His kisses were addictive. She wanted to spend the entire night right there in the park kissing him. What kind of wanton woman was he turning her into? We need to get back to the house. I feel like I'm doing something wrong sitting in a park kissing my sister's fiancé. He shook his head. I'm not your sister's fiancé. I'm marrying you. 
I don't care what was said in those letters we all sent back and forth. I have no desire to marry your sister. The idea of kissing her leaves me cold. I want to marry you. She looked into his eyes as well as she could by the light of the moon. I want to marry you too. He stood up and took her hand helping her to her feet. I guess knowing that will keep me going tonight as I sleep in the pitiful excuse for a bed that will be my only option at my brother's house. He has a guest room, but the mattress is lumpy. He shook his head as if the world would end if he had to spend more than one night in a lumpy bed. She smiled. Well, you'll be okay. I'll sleep in your bed while you sleep there. He groaned. I'll never sleep picturing you in my bed while I'm all the way across town. She smiled up at him. I will. I didn't get more than an hour or two of sleep a night on that train. I'm going to put my head on your pillow and fall straight to sleep. She found she liked the idea of sleeping in his bed. It would make her feel closer to him during hours they were apart. He smiled at the picture she drew for him. Tomorrow evening I'll take all four of us out to dinner somewhere. I'd like to treat you to a special meal. Her eyes widened. Tonight felt like a special meal to me. She'd never eaten off of such fine china or in such a fancy dining room. Even her meals at Harriet's house hadn't been as perfect. The only restaurant in town has an orchestra that plays. We can dance together. I've never danced before. I don't know how. Would he be disappointed when he realized she had no idea how people acted during formal dinners or dances? Sure, her manners were fine for a farmer's daughter, but for a banker's wife? She might need to read some books on etiquette. I'll teach you. I love the idea of dancing with you. There's an outside dancing area, and I want to hold you under the stars. You won't mind that, will you? Are you always going to be so good to me? He laughed. The good begins after we marry. I can't wait. Chapter 4 Ellen woke the next morning and for a moment wasn't sure where she was, but then hugged the pillow to her. She was sleeping on Patrick's pillow and just knowing that made her feel loved. She wasn't sure what she was supposed to do with her day, because the men wouldn't be there to take them to dinner for several hours, but she'd woken before the sun was up as she always had. She wandered down the stairs, tiptoeing quietly past Melinda's door, knowing her sister would still be asleep for a while yet. She walked down to the kitchen and looked inside. The cook, whom she had yet to meet, was standing over the stove. Good morning. The cook, an older woman with silver hair and pretty brown eyes, turned to her. Good morning. Are you Melinda? Ellen shook her head. No, I'm Ellen. Melinda's my sister. Oh. So you're marrying Mr. Wesley? Ellen flushed. That's still not decided. I'm actually hoping to marry Patrick. She knew the woman could have no allegiance to her sister, but she still felt guilty as she told her the plans may have changed. Oh. I thought Melinda would marry Mr. Patrick and you were to marry the sheriff. Ellen wasn't sure if she should be talking to the cook this way, but decided she was a person just like everyone else. If Patrick didn't like her being friendly with his staff, then he wasn't half the man she thought he was. Well, when we first saw the men, I didn't even notice Wesley, only Patrick. My sister only noticed Wesley. We were in the buggy to come home before any of us realized our mistake. She blushed as she recalled the strong feelings she'd had for Patrick on sight. I can't imagine being married to Wesley, but Patrick? He's wonderful. I didn't expect him to be, because he's a banker, but I don't think he's anything like the banker I knew back home. The older woman eyed her skeptically. You're not changing your mind because Patrick has money? Ellen laughed. She was pleased to see that Patrick's servants were so loyal to him. It told her a lot about the man she was considering marrying. Not at all. I'd be more likely to change my mind and not marry him because he has money. I genuinely like Patrick and want to spend the rest of my life with him. 
I only hope I can convince my sister that marrying a man you could someday love is more important than marrying a man who has money. The woman nodded slowly. She seemed to like Ellen's answers, but reserved judgment on the younger woman. I'm Alice. It's nice to meet you, Alice. Do you need help with breakfast? Ellen loved the idea of helping the cook out. She wanted to be able to do something with herself for the week she was here before any decisions were made. Alice shook her head. Of course not. You're a guest. Are you hungry? She pointed to the table in the kitchen letting Ellen know she wouldn't mind the company while she worked. Ellen nodded. I woke up famished. Dinner was wonderful last night, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Do you cook? Oh, yes. I've kept house for my father since I was twelve and my mother died. She sank into one of the chairs at the table. I can't imagine what I'll do with my time rattling around this big house during the day while Patrick works. She looked down at her hands, which she was wringing together nervously. To be honest, I'm much more suited to being a sheriff's wife. Alice smiled. I think you're just what Mr. Patrick needs in his life. Ellen smiled at the compliment. She didn't need the approval of Patrick's cook, but it was nice to have it. How long have you worked for him? Ever since my husband died, so three years? That sounds right. I'm sorry about your husband. Did you know Patrick before his death? Ellen enjoyed knowing the history of the people around her. Mr. Patrick was the banker who held the deed on our farm. After my husband's death, I had doctor bills to pay, and what little we had went to pay the bills. I knew I was going to lose the home, and it broke my heart. When I talked to Mr. Patrick about it, he said I should come and work for him. He offered to let me stay here, or I could keep on in my house and he would consider the hours I worked as paying for the rent as well as giving me a wage. I chose to just live here. There were too many memories there. Mr. Patrick's a good man. The words confirmed Ellen's suspicions about Patrick. He told her he didn't evict people, but she could see now that he told her the truth. Thanks for telling me all that. She loved the idea of the tall, handsome man doing such a kind thing for an elderly woman. She was so happy to see that her instincts about him had been right. You could already see the good in him. I wouldn't have told you otherwise. She grinned at Ellen. If you can't see the good in others, then he's too good for you. Melinda walked into the kitchen then, rubbing her eyes. Morning, she mumbled to Ellen. She sank into the chair across from Ellen, obviously still sleepy. Melinda, this is Alice. She's the one who made our delicious dinner last night. Alice, this is my younger sister, Melinda. Melinda's dark hair was pulled back in the braid she'd slept on. Ellen knew she'd fix it after breakfast, but was amused that she was willing to come down to breakfast looking like she did when either man could show up at any time. Melinda nodded politely. It's nice to meet you. Alice watched Melinda for a moment as if taking her measure. And you. I hear you may marry Mr. Wesley. Melinda tilted her head to the side as she studied her sister. That hasn't been decided yet. Once they were finished with breakfast, Ellen invited Melinda to go for a walk with her. She couldn't stand the idea of sitting around all day when she could be doing something. Have you thought more about the idea of marrying Wesley? Ellen asked. Melinda sighed. I don't want you to push me. I need to do what I think is right for me. She was obviously annoyed with Ellen for even bringing up the subject. I'm not trying to push you. I just know that I could never be as happy with Wesley as I would be with Patrick. I could love Patrick. Wesley would be someone I would have to force myself to marry. Surely she could convince her sister to make a decision within the next few days. Ellen hated the idea of waiting a full week. The men deserved to at least know who they would spend the rest of their lives with, and so did she. I feel the same way about Wesley as you do about Patrick, but I don't want to be poor. Wesley doesn't make the kind of money Patrick does, 
and I don't want to have to spend the rest of my life working as hard as our mother always did. She died way too young, because she didn't have a doctor when it was time to have the baby. I don't want to go through that. Melinda's voice rose as she said the words, determined to make her sister understand what she was saying. Ellen shook her head sadly. I hate putting the men off so much. I like the idea of marrying as soon as we can. They expected to marry us today, not in a week. She kicked at a pebble in the road. I think I would go home before I'd marry Wesley. I know I couldn't be happy married to him. You were ready to marry him with no questions asked. Now all of a sudden you can only marry Patrick. Why are you being so difficult about this? I'm not trying to be difficult. I'd never been attracted to a man before. I look at Patrick, and all I can think about is how much I want to be with him forever. Has Wesley kissed you? She knew it was no business of hers, but she knew she could use the information as leverage. Melinda blushed. Yes, he has. Did you enjoy it? Ellen asked, determinately pushing on. Melinda nodded. He made my toes curl. Ellen laughed. That's how Patrick makes me feel. I get this fluttering in my tummy that almost makes me feel sick. When he touches me, just touches my hand, I'm lost. I want to get closer and closer to him. I want to spend all day kissing him and not caring about anyone else in the world. I know, but what if I can't handle being poor? What if the housework is too much for me? You've always done most of the work. You've been poor all your life. You can handle it as well as anyone. And you know how to do housework as well as I do. You don't like it, but to be honest with you, other than sewing and cooking, I don't much like it either. I don't think there's a woman out there who enjoys getting down on her knees and scrubbing floors. It's just not something anyone would like. Ellen was getting exasperated with her sister. She knew Melinda wasn't as selfish as she sounded when she talked, but she needed to think of others for a change. I'll think about it. Ellen realized her sister had given in as much as she would for the day. Hopefully when she thought about it, she would draw the same conclusions Ellen had. Patrick is going to take us all to a restaurant tonight. He said there's dancing on a terrace outside and an orchestra. Melinda smiled. That sounds like a lot of fun. I can't wait to dance with Wesley. Melinda's eyes danced as she thought about dancing with the sheriff. Well, maybe we'll have to switch partners for a dance or two and see how it is with the other men. Ellen watched her sister carefully to see the response to her suggestion. Melinda wrinkled her nose. Do we have to? The words brought a smile to Ellen's face. Whether her sister knew it or not, she was going to marry Wesley. Ellen wanted to shout in relief. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. When the men arrived that evening to take them to the restaurant, Ellen made certain they both had their shawls laid out and ready to go. It was too chilly at night to go without them. They were wearing identical dresses because they'd used the same pattern for them both. Ellen's dress was green and Melinda's dress was blue. Patrick kissed Ellen's cheek and put the shawl over her shoulders. Are you ready? He was wearing a perfectly tailored black suit. Ellen thought he looked even more handsome than he had the day before. She hoped she didn't make a fool of herself staring at him too much. Ellen smiled. I've been ready all day. I haven't been able to think about anything else. She knew most women would be coy about their feelings, but she saw no point in that. When you cared for someone, you should let them know. What did you do today? Ellen made a face. Well, I got up early and talked to Alice while she cooked breakfast. I tried to talk her into letting me help, but she wouldn't. Then when Melinda got up, we went for a long walk. And then we came back here for lunch, and in the afternoon we both read books. I'm going to need to find something to do if this continues as we are. She sighed. I hate sitting idle. Patrick smiled and slipped his arm around her waist. After the children come, you'll have more to do. 
The look he gave her sent a tingle down her spine. Ellen felt her face soften at the idea of having his children. I'll love that. Do you want a boy first or a girl? She couldn't wait to hold his baby in her arms whether it was a girl or a boy. Definitely a boy. If we have any girls that look like you, I'll need help holding the boys off until she's old enough for courting. Ellen laughed. So you want eleven boys and one girl with the girl coming last? She'd heard that many men felt that way about the birth order of their children, but she'd never considered she may marry a man who felt that way. You understand me already. They laughed as they walked, unaware of the couple walking a few steps behind them. The more time Ellen spent with Patrick, the more she realized she couldn't marry Wesley. What was she going to do if Melinda decided she couldn't marry Wesley? The restaurant was beautiful. Ellen had never been in one, so she was in awe of the elegant surroundings. The beautiful chandeliers and the pristine tablecloths had her feeling nervous that she would do something wrong. Once the maitre d' handed her the menu, she flipped it open and glanced down the list. So many things on the menu were foods she'd never heard of. After a minute, she peeked over the menu and saw that Melinda was in a similar state of confusion. She had no idea what to get either. Ellen closed her menu and looked at Patrick who was watching her with a smile. Would you order for me please? Patrick nodded. I'd be happy to. When the food came, it was fantastic. He ordered her a filet mignon with a salad and a baked potato covered in butter. She took one bite of the small bacon-wrapped steak and her eyes widened with pleasure. This is delicious. Patrick's hand grasped hers. I'm glad you like it. Melinda was poking at her food, something that Ellen didn't quite recognize. She started to ask what it was, but wasn't sure if Melinda herself knew and didn't want to embarrass her. Once they were finished eating, Patrick stood and pulled back Ellen's chair, taking her hand, and leading her to the patio with the dancing. He moved her into his arms, and the slow dance they did was nothing like she'd imagined dancing would be. In her mind, dancing involved counting steps and being careful not to step on your partner's toes. With Patrick, it was more just staring into his eyes and moving when he did. It felt so perfect being in his arms. At the end of the dance, she whispered, I'd like to change partners. I want Melinda to see that you're not right for her and Wesley is. I can't imagine a better way to drive that home to her. He nodded skeptically. I don't want you to fall for my brother. She laughed. There's not a chance of that happening. She squeezed his hand to reassure him as they walked back toward the table. Back in the dining room, Patrick invited Melinda to dance. Wesley looked surprised, but he took Ellen's hand and led her to the dance floor. He stepped on her toe almost immediately. She didn't say anything, but she knew the grimace on her face let him know he'd hurt her. How was work today? she asked politely. He shrugged. It was work. There was little for me to do. My job doesn't involve a lot of criminals or gunfights. It's more just making my presence known so everyone knows there's a sheriff in town. Just that scares most of the criminals off. What's the most exciting thing you've ever done at work? It was so hard to talk to him, and so easy to talk to Patrick. She glanced over at her sister, and saw both of them looked as uncomfortable as she felt. Well, there was a claim jumper once who thought it was his right to take over someone else's claim just because the other man had left to go get food. The man took a couple of shots at me, but he was so drunk, he just shot the tree branch above my head. Wesley laughed as he talked about it. The man was wearing his long johns at the time, so he looked a real sight. Ellen sighed. This was the man she'd been certain she needed to marry? What had she been thinking? She was so glad they hadn't married as soon as they stepped off the train. She'd never have known how wrong he was for her then. After the dance, she took Melinda into the ladies' room to freshen up. What do you think of Patrick now that you've danced with him? Melinda shrugged. He's boring. I don't understand what you find so interesting about him. 
She shook her head, eyeing her sister skeptically. Talking to him is about as interesting as talking to a rock. Ellen smiled. That's the same thing I thought about Wesley. She could have danced a small dance right there in celebration of her sister thinking Patrick was boring. I'm not making any decisions tonight. Melinda crossed her arms over her chest and leaned against the wall. I know. I'm not trying to force you to. I just want to get to know them both. What if I'm the one making a mistake? They made their way back to the table, and after a few more dances, walked home together. Melinda and Wesley went to the parlor, while Ellen and Patrick went out to the back porch. She hadn't been out there yet, and as soon as she saw the porch swing, she smiled. I've always wanted a porch swing. She sat down on one end of it, making sure she left room for him. He took the spot she'd left vacant and set the swing into motion with his foot. Marry me, and it's all yours. She smiled, leaning her head against his shoulder, amazed at how comfortable she felt touching him. I'd rather share it with you. It wouldn't be fun to sit in all by myself. He used his forefinger to tilt her chin up for his kiss. His other hand moved around to the nape of her neck, softly moving his fingers across her skin. I'll share everything I own with you. She had to force herself not to climb into his lap and stay where she was. She hadn't been raised to be a wanton woman, but every minute she spent with him brought her closer and closer to it. After a minute, she tore her mouth away. I don't think it's a good idea for us to be alone together. I feel too much when you touch me. He chuckled softly. That's exactly what every man wants to hear. He dipped his head for one more kiss, and then settled back against the swing with her head against his shoulder again. Did you get a chance to talk to Melinda today? What does she seem to be thinking? Oh, she's going to drag her feet. She'll take the entire week to make her decision, I have no doubt. She paused staring up at the stars. In fact, I'll be surprised if she makes the decision before a month is out. She's going to hold us all hostage for as long as she can. Really? Ellen nodded. Yes. She has strong feelings for Wesley, but the idea of being poor frightens her. Maybe I'll give Wesley some money and tell him to tell her he's had it all along and was just waiting for the right woman to come along to spend it on. She laughed. That's a great idea. I don't think she'd fall for it, but it's a great idea. There had to be some way to force her into a decision, though. Something would give. Wesley would never agree to it. He's too honest for that, which is a good thing. He sighed. I just don't want to have to wait. She snuggled closer to his side. It is. I just wish we could find a way to speed up her decision. I'll do my best to be obnoxious and unlovable tomorrow. She giggled. Are you able to do that? Don't see why not. I've scared women off before. I can scare her. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. No amount of talking did any good the following day. Melinda refused to make a decision. By the time the men arrived, Ellen was frustrated beyond belief. She wanted the whole thing over with. It would be so much easier if she could just get married and get on with her life. She enjoyed being courted, but she felt as if her life were in a sort of limbo as she waited for Melinda to agree with how they wanted to do things. They had dinner at Patrick's house. Ellen had begged Alice to take the day off and had spent the day in the kitchen cooking. She'd made a pot roast with mashed potatoes and gravy and carrots. To go along with it, she'd made a dozen biscuits and for dessert, she talked Melinda into baking a cake. Melinda had a way with baking that always surprised Ellen, because she put so little effort into it. They could follow the exact same recipe, and Ellen's dessert always tasted better when they were done. When they were finished with dessert, Ellen went with Wesley into the parlor and watched as Melinda followed Patrick outside to the porch swing. She hated the idea of her sister going off with the man she had feelings for, but she didn't know how to stop them. Melinda sat down on the sofa and gave Wesley a tentative smile. 
He sat beside her on the couch and took her hand in his, but she moved it to her lap, putting it out of his reach. She knew he was trying to be affectionate, but just having his hand in hers made her skin crawl. So tell me about gold mining, she said, trying to get him to talk about anything she could think of. She had nothing to say to the man. Well, we'd heard about all the gold that was here in the Rockies, so we decided to come out here and see for ourselves. We followed a wagon train that was heading for California, but we stopped off here. He shrugged. It was hard, but Patrick and I shared a wagon and took turns driving the oxen. By the time we got here, I was ready to give up, but Patrick kept pushing. We each found a claim. He gave me first choice, because that's just how he is. I picked wrong, and he got the right one. As soon as he struck gold, he offered to share the claim with me, but I was certain mine would have more gold in the long run. So I asked him to pay me an hourly wage, and I worked for him until his claim was played out, and then we moved on to mine. In over six months, we never saw a speck of gold on my claim. Finally, I agreed we could stop, and he opened his bank. He was worried about outlaws, but knew the area needed a bank with all the gold miners around, so he asked if I'd run for sheriff. There was no competition, so I won. Wesley grinned. It was the easiest contest ever. I guess it helps having a lawman here with the bank around, but Patrick is really the one who pays my wages. He offered me a job in the bank, but it would have felt like charity. I can't live off my brother forever. Ellen nodded. The more he told her, the more she knew that Patrick was the man she wanted to marry. I'm glad you're happy being the sheriff. I'm sure you get to meet some interesting people. Wesley shrugged. I do enjoy it, but wish I had struck it rich when Patrick did. I would enjoy having the kind of money my brother does, if only so I could give Melinda the world she deserves to have. You have strong feelings for my sister, don't you? Ellen could see that he did, but she wanted him to confirm her suspicions. He nodded. I do. I wish she'd end all this and just agree to marry me. I know she doesn't think I realize that she's afraid to be poor, but I do. He looked down at his hands and sighed. You didn't seem to mind it though. I didn't want to be married to a banker because of what happened to us when our father died. She shrugged. I've always been poor, so the idea of staying poor doesn't bother me a bit. I'm actually more afraid I'll go out of my mind with nothing to do, but I care enough for Patrick it doesn't matter to me. He gave her a confused look. What happened? Melinda hasn't told me anything. She briefly explained about the banker coming out to their house and how afraid of being poor Melinda was. That's why she wanted to marry Patrick. That makes a lot of sense. He gave her a questioning look. You're set on marrying him now, aren't you? I can tell he'd never be that way. I have such strong feelings for Patrick and have since I first saw him. It's strange. At first I was convinced that he must be you, and everything seemed right with the world. My heart dropped into my stomach when I realized I had feelings for the wrong brother. Wesley smiled. Are you sure you couldn't have feelings for me? He leaned toward her as if he was going to kiss her, but she quickly turned her face away. Absolutely certain. There's no way I could feel this way about two men. When he does something as simple as takes my hand, I want to lean into him and spend the rest of my life with him. You took my hand, and all I wanted to do was put it back on my own lap and away from you. He laughed. Well, I guess that about sums it up. I wish it was different, honestly. I do think you'd make a better wife for me than you would for my brother, but if there's no, attraction is I guess the best word, there's no point. I'm so glad you agree with me. She grinned at the man who she hoped would soon be her brother-in-law. Oh, I do. I just wish we could get Melinda to agree. The parlor door opened then and Melinda walked in with an irritated look. She sat down between Ellen and Wesley on the sofa and leaned into Wesley. I don't like your brother as much as I like you. Wesley smiled, stroking her arm. 
Ellen tried not to watch, but she was fascinated with how her sister reacted to him when she felt nothing at all. Does that mean you want to marry me now? Melinda sighed. It means I'm a lot closer to making a decision than I was an hour ago. Melinda sounded disgusted. What could Patrick have done to make her so angry? Ellen stood up and walked out to the porch and saw Patrick leaning up against a post. What did you do to my sister? Patrick turned to her and she could see his grin by the light of the full moon. I just tried to hold her hand and told her that she has the most beautiful sister in the world. Ellen laughed aloud. That was obnoxious. I tried. I don't want to be downright rude though, because even if I don't marry the woman, she's still going to be my sister-in-law and a big part of my life. I need to be able to get along with her. She walked over and took his hand, pulling him along with her to the porch swing. What would you do if you didn't care if you got along with her for the rest of your life? He shrugged, his eyes dancing as they gazed into hers. I'd probably tell her that I like to have spitting contests with all the miners that come into the bank and give them better rates if they can spit further than me. That would certainly not endear my sister to you. She grinned thinking about Patrick saying that. She knew him well enough to know he would never actually do it, but her sister certainly didn't. How about you? Would you mind if I had spitting contests with the miners? She laughed snuggling into his side. Why would I mind? As long as you didn't let them spit on you and expect me to clean your clothes, I wouldn't care. Do you have spitting contests with the miners? Never have. The thought had never crossed my mind. Maybe I should. If you decide to do it, let me know. I'd like to hire a photographer to come and take some pictures of it. We could use them to advertise your banking services. A banker who spits with his customers will always do what's best for them could be your slogan. He grinned down at her. Do you know what I like best about you? She shook her head. No, what? I like that you put up with my crazy sense of humor. She smiled. Melinda told me you're boring. I don't see it, but whatever she thinks. She can say you're boring every day of the year as long as she marries your brother. Just so you know, whatever she decides, I'm not marrying her. I'm not at all interested in your sister. I'm marrying you. She kissed the shoulder her head was resting against. She's not going to decide to marry you. She'd make too many people unhappy by doing that and she knows it. When do you think she'll make a decision? She shrugged. I'm going to work on her all day tomorrow. I think she already knows what her decision is going to be, but she's just dragging her feet because she likes living here and having people do for her. She paused for a moment looking out to the garden. We stayed with the woman who owns the mail-order bride business for six weeks before we came here. Why? I told you the banker came to our house and told us we only had a few days to get out. Right? Well, that's the day we responded to your letters. We met Harriet Long and explained the situation, and she invited us to live with her until we heard back from you. She looked down at her hands for a moment. I hated doing it, but we have nowhere else to go. Melinda loved it. He ran his hand down her arm. Why did she love it? Harriet had servants and Melinda liked having others do the chores she doesn't care for. I did everything I could to earn my keep, but Melinda? She just enjoyed her time there. What was Harriet like? I corresponded with her, of course, but I never really got a feel for her as anything but a businesswoman. Ellen thought carefully about how to answer that. She didn't want to betray Harriet by revealing what she'd heard the night she'd gotten up, but she wanted to give a true picture of her. She was a mystery. She's a widow, but never mentions her late husband. She's generous to a fault. If she met someone with no shoes on the street, she would remove her own and give them away. She is obviously very wealthy and she walks with a pronounced limp. I genuinely liked her as a person and would have liked to get to know her better, but she seems to close people out. 
I never saw her entertain, and she spends almost all of her time working for her brides. She takes a personal interest in every woman that she places. She sounds like an interesting woman. She is. Once we received our letters from you and Wesley, she gave us this little talk she said she gives to all of her brides about how we shouldn't feel like we have to stay in a situation where we're treated badly. It was strange, because she obviously believes in what she does. She works so hard to find the right man for each woman, and yet she seems to worry about every woman she sends off. I wrote to her yesterday morning about what happened when we arrived, and how we're not married yet, but I'll write to her as soon as we are. She truly seemed to care what happened to us. Patrick sat silently for a moment. Maybe someday we'll find out more about her. I don't know. You're right, though. That is strange. She was truly one of the best people I've ever met. I miss her. After she'd said the words, she was surprised. She hadn't realized how much she'd miss Harriet after they left. They sat quietly for a few minutes before he stood up. I need to get back to Wesley's house. I have some work that has to get done tonight. I've been trying not to work in the evenings this week, but I don't have a choice right now. Ellen stood with him, going into his arms to hug him tightly. Thank you for making time for me. He laughed softly. I'll always make time for you.